Hello, welcome to this next uh, Route 6 Ask Us Anything, um, uh, where we're going to talk a bit about TV tech. I've got a couple of things to bring. I'm going to talk a little bit about the 17th edition of the uh, the IET wiring regulations. I'm going to talk a little about fibre as well, different grades of cable, different connectors, what they're used for. Um, but quickly, once around the table, our uh, our noble esteemed boss uh, Rupert Watson joining us from uh, from his country estate. Look at those look at those dark beams. <laughs> And Reese Llewellyn, our splendid ex-colleague who now works at NBC Universal, joining us from what looks like a very clean white room. Well, how are you doing, Reese? I'm good, thanks. Is it padded? <laughs> <laughs> Lo- loving the snapback, Reese, and the hipster glasses. <laughs> I can I can wear it like this if it if it you know just to give you a bit more hipster. Vibe. You just very, you just got twenty percent cooler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And o- o- it's a bit, bit Nathan Barley, mate. Careful. <laughs> and o- over there, in a very sensible fashion, uh, Mr. David Skeggs, our good colleague, coming to us from what looks like the Route 6 sales office. Am I right? Yeah. There we go. In Water Muse. And uh, oh, is that Tony behind you? There you go. Wheeling and dealing, cutting deals, selling equipment. <laughs> so before we um, before we get any further, I just want to ask you, Rupert, about um, what we've been up to for the last two days. Tell us about Platform One. Okay. So the last couple of days, we've um, been down at the White Space in uh, Leicester Square, which actually turned out to be a very nice venue. We had a last-minute readjustment. The um, place we were going to use uh, Crossrail cut off the power, which was a little disappointing. Um, but the last-minute uh, change of venue was very, very uh, propitious. It was um, actually a very good place to do a demonstration, so I think we'll probably be using that again. Um, and so what we've really been doing is a number of presentations about the kind of technologies that we think are possibly less well-known, uh, in, in our kind of customer base and, and ones which they could take advantage of in order to you know make more of their business, do things better, work with us in a um, you know, better way. So you guys were Philly was talking about how SI jobs can go well or badly, and I went through some of the right technologies using um, KVM over IP, and obviously, excuse me, discussing the way the avid everywhere proposition could potentially transform you know the way in which people uh, certainly geographically the way in which people do post. Um, Mr. Skeggs went through the how the sort of uh, end of more project we've been doing recently can um, provide the, the opportunity to right there, Rings. Um, oh, a visitor. <laughs> not a visitor. <laughs> how, um, how we can uh, yeah, essentially provide a, a pipeline by which you can take existing assets and you know, turn them into cash. YouTube. Um, funny enough, on that subject, I, I met a lady from a company called Hypercast who. Um, uh, essentially, a kind of uh, French Akamai, um, and learned a little bit about the costs involved in distributing your content online, and um, effectively charge pence per gigabyte. Um, and interestingly, the, the higher quality data you put online, i.e., you know, if you've got a kind of six megabit as opposed to a two megabit file, um, clearly your costs increase quicker. So if you're paying pences, pence per gigabyte moved, which is to say the amount of plays you get increases the, the, the amount of money you owe them. Um, the, the kind of larger the file, the better quality file, or the larger the file online, um, means that your kind of meter is running faster. A bit like, you know, if you've got to imagine it as a water meter, but as a data meter, every time someone plays your video, that's essentially adding to your bill from hypercast at the end of the month, whatever. But it was an inter- interesting model. Um, and then uh, after that, we talked about uh, the boys from Pixit who've got um, a very interesting and, and fairly unusual proposition, which is they are effectively a professional services um, company who provide commodity storage as uh, very, very high performance shared storage, which can scale out and you can have everything inside of it, both NAS, you know, high performance storage and, you know, kind of fairly low cost, low, low um data movement archive. So all of those presentations went down very well. I think people felt we'd passed on a little bit of information they perhaps didn't have before. Um, so yeah, very pleased with it. A lot of sensible customer interaction and uh, maybe even the old sale, who knows. <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the aim at these kind of events, isn't it? <laughs> Indeed it is. Skeggs, you got anything to, to add? What, um, what, what did you find interesting about the whole business? I was going to say, we should probably do an Ask Us Anything with the boys from Flavorsys, do an international version um, and get the Germans uh, to kind of do a little bit of a Flavorsys chat. Flavorsys, the p- people behind Strawberry, yeah? Yeah. yeah do, do, do you want to just tell us a bit about Strawberry? What, what's that all about? So, uh, essentially, Flavorsys is um, 
bit of software that was written by um, some chaps in Berlin who effectively worked in post and didn't either want or couldn't afford to buy an artist or edit share or whatever. So they effectively wrote a software layer that allowed them to do collaborative project sharing. And increasingly, it's becoming more and more useful. It's got some really nice features. And the latest iteration, which is Strawberry 4, which is um, a sort of HTML5 web page in its administrative role, um, does some very neat things. Basically, in simple terms, it allows you to organize your media into an individual folder uh, per project, which is then ushered into view to the client that would, needs to work on it. So um, it's probably best to try and do a demo. I'm not going to try and explain it in, the, in sort of words of one syllable, but it uh, allows you to use you know, non-avid storage within an avid editing environment, which is obviously a, a driver for some people, but it's, it's an awful lot more than that. It uh, works really with Adobe Premiere, with Final Cut 10, Final Cut 7, uh, and, and Media Composer equally, and it, it provides similar similar benefits to all of those. Um, so for example, we were talking to the guys at the BBC about um, deploying their Exan uh, in, a, in a, a heterogeneous environment where some people want to run Final Cuts, some people want to run Avid, some people want to run Premiere, uh, some people want to run Final Cut 10.1, and it effectively provides the, um, the glue, as it were, the layer that, uh, that enables that. Ah, jolly good. Now, Mr. Skeggs, any anything you you you, um, you noticed by the people we were talking to? Lost you, Dave. You've gone mute again. Reese, you... oh, there you are. I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think it's a good opportunity to meet uh, customers and people that actually live the dream, as it were, at the coalface and understand what uh, their take is on on certain products and workflows and technologies. So it's always good to hear. From people actually do it day to day. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's interesting. You do these presentations, and you, you one does feel a little a bit of an imposter, kind of saying, "Yeah, you know, this is how it's done," or "How yeah, it's done." Exactly. Yeah. This yeah. might one way you could do it, rather than sort of you know laying it down as if I'm kind of doing. Because I think, as you say, when you're actually doing it day to day, what looks like a good idea in a sort of you know pre-sales role is on yes. occasion. So uh, yeah. But truth to tell, we we see an awful right, lot of people doing things, don't we? We see an awful lot of people and the mistakes they make, and, and yeah, you know. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, the support guys are, I guess, at the at the, the the front end as well, and yeah, we hear from from their their woes and their challenges the customers are facing. Yeah, and with that, we sort of build that knowledge with the the products that we've got. Definitely. Reese, anything yeah. anything that tickled your fancy over the last couple of days? Because you, you came and joined us yesterday, didn't you? Yeah, no, t totally. I mean, I, I kind of. Um, and I completely agree with with you know what Rupert and, and David are saying in terms of you know from a, from a customer side now it's really interesting you know having challenges and you know conundrums to sort of to um, you know to get over and then you know sitting and listening to David and Rupert talk about you know their take on how to essentially you know solve these problems it's really really interesting it was good, it was nice to see the the Flavorsys boys because. Um, it seems like their products come a long way since I last saw it, which was probably yeah, it has. a no, it's massive, massive difference. It, it seems like they've introduced some. It's all, almost working as some sort of like little baby mam as well, by mm -hmm. the looks of things, like with a little searchable, you know, front end. Yeah, no, auto proxies all the time, which is interesting, and it's because it, obviously if you've got a cut, um, and you've you don't even need to check it in. I mean, it, it kind of is obviously looking after your media all the time. So if you basically do an edit in any of the applications you're working in, it essentially auto-proxies not only your assets, your rushes, but also um, you know, all your sequences. Mm. Um, what they sort of mentioned, which I hadn't kind of twigged, is now it's no longer Silverlight, the kind of application that you, you run. Okay. When you're running. What are they using now? It's an HTML5 web page. So in uh, yeah. management on an iPad, whatever, can effectively yeah. log into the strawberry and watch any of the assets in, you know, in their proxy form. Um, so yeah, no, and, and there's some nice little features like they've, 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 they used to have a kind of status field, which was a little bit pointless because it was on the side and no one ever went there. Um, but yeah. they've now implemented it where you can interactively create statuses. So you know, needs checking, waiting for QC, you know, mm. you know waiting for legal or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And now that pops up as a reminder every time you close a project. You, if you've got status kind of enabled, it'll ask you to put the checkbox in the right place as you kind of close your project. Mm -hmm. so, um, no, there's some really, really tidy little features in it. 
Yeah, I mean, and they're very nice, and they're nice guys. Yeah, they're very, they're very cool guys as well. And you know, f seeing these things, it sort of you know rings true from my side in terms of like what you know, what we're looking for at you know certain parts of NBC and and how these things can sort of you know potentially how you guys could inject those things into you know into kind of our workflow and our environment is really useful. I really enjoyed the um the was it Melanox? Mm. Yeah. Uh, chap at the end as well. I felt a bit for him because he was, he was kind of like he said, the graveyard shift. Everyone was kind of dozing and desperate to get out in the sun, and especially when you when you're talking about Ethernet switches and stuff like that, it can get a bit much. But he, that, that you know that um, model of of uh, like um, one U, one half U, um, in twelve. Yeah, uh, uh, like uh, was it? It wasn't a ten gig switch. It was a it's a one. It can do one, ten, forty, six, forty. Yeah. Is that going to be the one that's going to do a hundred, or is that a different model? Um, I can't remember. I think he may have said the silicon can handle it. So yeah, yeah. I think maybe it, it will. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I chatted with him, and he said out of the gate it's forty. Um, there'll be a firmware upgrade to fifty-six. Um, but uh, but it won't do a hundred. But I mean, yeah, yeah, fifty-six gigabits. Who needs a hundred? Eh? On and, yeah. and there's non-port blocking as well. So so there's you know literally I think he said there was sixteen terabits of bandwidth across the back plane. So if you had if you had every single port populated with the the, the ten gig Ethernet breakouts uh, and everyone was going at full tilt, you'd be seeing sixteen terabits of bandwidth across the back plane. Something they're aiming for. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's gonna, you're going to need a few spindles to do that, I thought. Yeah, well, the guys at Pix Media, I'm sure they could. Uh... <laughs> well, I mean, that's why, that's why they've got Melanox switches in, in the Pixit solution. Obviously, they, they potentially do have the capacity to generate some sort of, um, you know, at least close to that sort of data, but um, obviously the customers themselves need it. But it is coming. I mean, you know, we, we do, you know, our larger customers, you know, guys like, um, you know, Deluxe Digital London, who are, doing the whole kind of feature film delivery, you get these enormous data sets land on you. Everybody needs to access the same set of data across multiple, you know, workstations. And, and, and uh, in that scenario, you can, you know, you can be pulling some serious data out. Um, but uh, the new Clipster is going to be able to do 240 frames a second, I think. And um, that's, yeah, you know, that's quite a lot of data. That's quite a, quite a data rate. And if you imagine you've got as I think they've got sort of 12 or 14 clipsters, you know, that's, uh, if you imagine you've got 12 or 14 clipsters, all of which could potentially do 240 frames a second at 2K. So that's 306 megabytes a second times typically 24. So 240. That's a hell of a lot of data moving. That's like a fire hose of data, isn't it? It just doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, oh, um, can I butt in with my first little thing that I was going to tell you about? So, 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 so one one of the slides I was I was throwing up um, at, at the the thing over the last couple of days was um, relating to mains. I mean, you saw I had that kind of um, photo I'd taken of the three phase incoming at a facility in Soho, and essentially you do the numbers, you, you know, you calculate it, and they were paying about twice as much as they should have been for their electricity because the electricity company charges you at three times your most heavily used phase. So if you've only got you know, if you're dragging 48 amps on one phase, 14 amps on the other phase, and nothing on the third phase, you're being billed for three times 48 amps when you calculate that through into kilowatt hours. Uh, and, and as a consequence, if you leave a phase unused or if you underutilize any phases, you know, you're, uh, you're into serious overexpenditure for your electricity. You, know, you can wind up paying, worst case, three times more for your electricity than you should. Um, uh, my granddad, who was an engineer at the Rolls-Royce factory in, in Gloucester, um, he had a colleague who's that's all his job was it was just to monitor the phases the whole time you know he, he just looked at at the three ammeters every morning to make sure that the that, that, that the machines in the factory were all dragging constant current on all three phases and uh, and that was his job you know to, his salary was paid for by the money saved in not you know unbalancing the phases so um that's kind of like a, a pertinent electrical kind of consideration but um, you can't really talk about electricity without talking about the 17th edition. And so if I screen so, share... So, so when the phases are unbalanced, do you sort of notice anything on the uh, 
a machine level hardware level no no not at all not at all if you if you consider that that most most facilities don't actually need three phases the only things you typically need three phases for in a modern facility are the lift a lift motor needs a three phase supply big air conditioning three needs three phases and big ups's need three phases and so you big ups once you get above um once you get above 12 or 16 amps, so, so 3 kVA, 3.5 kVA, then, then nobody really makes a, sing, a single phase um, online UPS that's, that's um, not a three-phaser. Yeah. So, so anything that doesn't live in the bottom of a bay that isn't sort of mm. two or three U's big, UPS-wise, is generally speaking a three-phaser sits in the corner mm. of the machine room. Um, but yeah, yeah, balancing the phase is very important. Um, so, so here's uh, so here's the Wikipedia uh, page about um, BS uh, seventy six seventy one, which is the overall arching standard that covers all the 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 well, what was the IEE wiring regulations is now been taken over by the IET, um, which is it's my, like a villain in Tintin. Yeah, yeah, which they, yeah, that's that's actually my um, uh, um, institute. Let me let me show you um, what I've got here. Well, one of the things we we banged on a lot about was well, at the beginning of each meeting field, you all stand there and go IEE. <laughs> so here is here is our well thumb copy of the uh, the seventeenth edition, which is the current version. You can see it's quite a, quite a thick uh, volume. If I go back, well, it in, is well thumb. If I go back in time, there's my copy of the sixteenth edition, which was um, which was used until um, two thousand and eight. That was that was Hold up together. Sorry. Hold it up together. So so that's the sixteenth edition, um, and this is the the seventeenth edition. So, why, is, why is that one bigger? Uh, just a lot more text, you know. There's quite a lot going on in there. Where's um, the PDF? Oh, somewhere on the on the internet. Now let me show you something. You'll, you'll like this. I will show you the first edition of the the IET cool. wiring the IE wiring regulations from 1892. 1882, I think you'll find. So um, really? there it is. Can you see that? It's six pages. Oh, yeah. That's the first. That's the first two pages I've got up on on there. And it's. Can you see some of the things it talks about? The dynamo machine. Don't and, put your fingers in it. And the wires. Every <laughs> switch used for, for tuning the current, to turn the current on or off, must be constructed so that it is, when it's moved left, it cannot permit permanent heating effects. So, I mean, yeah, this is kind of Victorian. Like that kind dynamo of, machine should be fixed in a dry place. Yes, yeah. We need to put that, we need to put that in our statement of work, Phil. <laughs> yeah, as, as per <laughs> the first edition of the IE wiring regulations. Yeah. Store your equipment in a dry place. So, so I mean, you know, this is this is 140 years ago, you know, and and, and now we're up to the 17th edition. Um, but BS 7671 colon 2008 is the 17th edition, and uh, I've got um, the Schneider page up here. And and one of the things that came with the the 17th edition was the requirement for residual current devices RCDs. So if you're if you're an electrician or or a design engineer designing an, an electrical installation, you have to show good cause why you wouldn't put an RCD, an earth leakage breaker, um, in circuit. Um, and in fact, I'm I'm just about to embark on building a um, uh, a new kitchen. In fact, there's the there's the layout of my new kitchen, and I'm going to have to I'm going to have to put a new uh, mains distribution board in there and make sure that uh, you know I've got RCDs feeding all those circuits because that's now a requirement. It wasn't a requirement before, but it is now. So have, you got picture, have you got a picture of the RCDs in um, in Nigeria then? Well, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Skegs, you'll remember this. Um, a job, a job that, that that Dave and I did a couple of years ago. Um, the little machine uh, area where we were building our rack and, and wiring out our edit, uh, our, um, our 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 um, ingest desks from. Um, that, that, this is very sort of sta standard, it seems, in Nigeria. Um, you know, and and look, I mean, the worst thing is, well, I don't. I mean, obviously, the worst thing is you've got bare wires shoved into the current carrying conductors there. But you're saving, you're saving money on a plug there, mate. But well, I suppose, but but also they've they've clearly um, put the they've they've mounted the plug point before they realised they had to wire into it, and they, they just bust a hole in it and 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 wired the the incoming twin and earth <laughs> through a, a cracked hole in the case of the uh, of the plug point, and then that's the outgoing. I'll make sure a builder with those chaps. Um, in fact, we we offered we offered um, the, the the guys at Lagos TV where we were working. We offered them the uh, electrical safety test results for our installation, and they kind of looked at it and sort of smiled knowingly. You know, what will we do with this kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> have you got the telegraph pole anywhere or not? Uh, I probably have. Yes, I've just found that one actually. Two seconds. Let yeah. me just open that. I've also found their um, their uh, their hard disk recorders. Uh, 
which <laughs> was quite comical as well. <laughs> um, where is it? <laughs> uh, right, I need to share. How do I share? So the left, uh, uh, top left, the um, the the green glyph screen share, and then select oh, yeah. the app rather than your screen. Otherwise, you can see you'll get video hell round. Otherwise, uh, so there we can. Can we see this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. That was yeah. So that was their main transmission server. That was on air as we were standing looking at it. Look at that. <laughs> uh, dear. Um, and then the transmitter is here. Is that it? Yes. And then, Can you see that? <laughs> their transmission software was some French company I'd never heard of that does like a very basic transmission system, MPEG-2 style. We're back to you, Skeggs. We, had, we didn't see the... Uh, uh, here we go. Oh, it's not giving me the box now. See if I can beat you to it. Oh. It's a race. Three one nine three is the image. If you've got the still the same numbers. Uh, so anyway, that that was their that was their main UHF transmission transmitter in the staff car park, not yeah. not in a field half a mile away, but actually in the staff car park. And although you know, obviously at, at six hundred megahertz UHF, it's not a danger from an RF point of view. It's a danger from the fact that, that you've got a huge amount of energy being pushed up that that pole, and uh, you know you get too close to that, and there's a risk of arcing and such. And the other thing. <coughs> Which um, I mean, you wouldn't be allowed in this country. You would not be allowed to um, to have a, um, a, a, a a UHF transmitter so close to where people were working. Um, so no one's no one's attached any wires to that though, pulling anything off that. Well, look at this. Here we go. This is another picture Hi. from downtown uh, Lagos. So this is all all the electrical poles you see. Um, they've all got home added on um, downlinks into people's businesses and houses. And we actually saw a guy. Up a pole with a craft knife, you know, scraping off the live conductors, dropping a cable down to his mate, and just just kind of winding it on, you know. So um, dangerous, dangerous place, you know. And you imagine that the electricity company probably lose more than half of their electricity. Now, yeah. they may not be balancing phase there. <laughs> Possibly not, no. <laughs> but uh, nice guys, it was it was a good job. I enjoyed working there, D didn't you, Dave? It was. Uh, I, I thought it was a good good place yeah, to be. Yeah, it was, yeah. Very good experience. Yeah. Um, yes. I just found the bo the picture of the complaint box. Remember that on the way in? <laughs> <laughs> I actually dropped the complaints in it. I said, get a new complaint box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, that was, that was funny. That was a good, good trip. Good job. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this... this. <laughs> So anyway, back to the 17th edition. Here's, here's the Wikipedia page, which is it, it's interesting and worth a read. And it's interesting that it, that it applies in lots of other countries. Lots of other countries uh, adopt our safety standards. I don't know how, how sort of, um, you know, wholeheartedly they do, but, but it lists some of the countries there, Mauritius, St. Lucia. But, I mean, basically old colonies, they all, they all you know, abide by the same regulation as us. So you kind of hope Very they do good. anyway. Um, uh, yes, please, if you don't mind. And, and I suppose for us, the, 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 the thing is that, that this is... Um, kind of the meat and veg of what we do when we're doing an electrical installation. You know, this is what you kind of expect from us. You know, test results for every circuit and a, an installation that complies to the 17th edition. Um, uh, as I think I alluded to in our talk yesterday, there's, there's, there's one um, SI who sell their own um, branded PDUs and their PDU can't even pass the, the earth leakage test. Um, so you kind of think, well, are they just kind of like signing off every bay as being not passed, or are they actually not doing any testing at all? That's the kind of worry for me. <laughs> so they, would they be liable then if there's there's any problem, or how does that work? Well, the thing is, the seventeenth edition is not a legal requirement. The seventeenth edition is is a recommendation, and if if you if you were to um, uh, kill somebody. Um, well, in first place, uh, Rupert and the other directors would be responsible. That's part of your um, responsibility as a company director. Um, but you'd have a, a difficult time in court proving that you'd diligently 
made sure you weren't going to kill somebody if you couldn't show that you'd 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 done your job by the strictures of the of the seventeenth edition. I don't I don't imagine any judge would take you seriously if you said yes we knew we were installing a kit equipment that was sub the standard. Um, you know they just say well what else was sub the standard? You know, you weren't testing or whatever. Okay. But um, yeah, seventeenth edition has been with us now for six years. And um, I, I, I did my training back in the summer of two thousand and eight, um, and you know it's. Uh, I mean, it might sound dull as dishwater, but uh, but I'd encourage anybody who who um, has any involvement in facilities mains to, to to kind of you know do do the current training for that. You know, sort of two or three days, a thousand quid, and and you know you can be rest assured that you're not going to fall foul of the law. Um, when I did my training, there was a guy um, uh, from the health and safety executive who uh, a real sort of brusque northerner and he had a bunch of slides to show us and and they were it was literally one slide after the other and each one was you know this lad had the the breaker board explode in his face because it was badly wired and he had the sort of photos of the guy in hospital you know and just just a sort of a burnt mess of a man you know this fella you know it, it, the electricity arced into him you know as he was doing this because he wasn't he wasn't wearing rubber boots or whatever and again there's another hideously disfigured young man you know who's who's never going to live his life again kind of thing and by the end of it this whole kind of lecture hall full of kind of engineers and electricians you know were just kind of pale you know kind of my word <laughs> but at the same time um, there's not that many people killed by electricity anymore in Britain if you look back to the 70s where they reckoned there was about 7,000 people killed by electrical shock every year in Britain. Now it's down to, you know, kind of sub-50. It's, it's tiny by comparison. And a lot of that is just down to the fact that, you know, people are a lot more compliant and a lot more um, obsessed with, with health and safety. Health and safety nightmare, but, you know, I think health and safety is a good thing. It's gone mad. Yeah, it's gone, so, gone mad, according to the Daily Mail. So where does pat testing on the appliance side of things fit into the 17th edition? So Who is pat? Yes. Who is Pat and who's his appliance? <laughs> so Pat stands for Portable Appliance Tester. And, and it's what you have to do to things that aren't powered by a fixed supply. So if it's not a supply that's bolted onto the wall, if it's not either a 13 amp outlet or a 16 amp, in our case, outlet on the wall, it has to be Pat tested. And so that's, that's the power supply that feeds a bay. So from the, from the C-form connector above the racks or below the racks, or the C-form connector that feeds the edit desk, um, from that point, you have to be covered by a PET test. And so, and so it's either the equipment that's plugged into it, um, which after a year of use has to be retested. It, it, again, these are all recommendations, but you have to have, as an organisation, you have to have a, a, a policy that covers this. And, and also all the cabling that goes from that fixed point you know, uh, you know, notionally deriggable cables, cables that could be removed just by snipping cable ties, kind of thing. They they have to be covered by a pat test, and that's why um, you look in in a bay that we've handed over, and you know that every circuit has been run through the pat test, and there's, there's five tests um, that we that we do and make a measurement to show that the earth continuity is good, um, the uh, earth leakage through the system is good. Um, we do a flash test, which is a stress test for the for the for the safety earth, which means that you know if you measure the safety earth just with your with your multimeter and you say, look, there's only 0.1 of an ohm of resistance in the earth path. That's fantastic. That's well within spec. But what you don't realise is that the earth cable has almost come off inside the PDU, uh, and it's hanging on by a single strand. The flash test runs uh, 1500 volts back up the earth. And so if there's any weak points in the earth connection, they'll be burned out by the flash test. And the flash test is there to be a, a sort of like a final stress test that you do one time to the earthing within the bay to make sure that you're not relying on an earth that's just kind of hanging on by a single thread kind of thing. So, um, you know, if you, I mean, go to our web, go, go to our blog uh, and, and, and look at what you'd expect to get as test results from a Route 6 wide cabinet and you'll see exactly what we test for. Um, but uh, they're all things that, 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 that are covered by a PAT tester. And a PAT tester is the piece of equipment that under the 17th edition is the piece of equipment you have to use for testing portable appliances or non-fixed wiring. That's the expression they use. So, so wiring that isn't terminated in a connector that's bolted to the wall, like a 13 amp outlet or a 16 amp C-form connector. So on the subject of mains, but just quickly, the old Met Police, I'm always tickled by the story of them recording the mains for investigative purposes that uh... yes now just give me a second to um to, to pull up that um that that story on the route six blog um 
and uh, and, and that's, it's, that's worth retelling. So the Met Police, who we occasionally do training for, we're about to do, do some more training for them uh, next month. It's their... Um, their, their, their um, what are they called? The Forensics Department. Um, they... Um, so I was there a couple of years ago doing training for their video techs. And as I say, just give me a moment. I'm just going to bring up the, the uh, uh, page from the Route 6 blog. Um, there we go. You should be able to see that. Welcome back, Reese. So we're just talking about, um, uh, you know, in relating to mains. This is, this is something we found out when I was last down at the Met Police doing training um, uh, for, their, for their forensics uh, technicians. It's called uh, Electrical Network Frequency Analysis. And so... Uh, what you may or may not know is that the whole of Britain is an electrical network. It's a, it's a, it's a grid. It's sometimes referred to as the national grid, isn't it? So every single power station in the country is connected to this grid. And so when, for example, a power station has been taken offline for maintenance or, or whatever, when they spin the generators back up again, they have to synchronise them with the rest of the grid before they connect. Otherwise, there'd be sparks, you know. So every, every generator in Britain is running synchronised with all the others. 50 hertz. So each generator is spinning 50 times a second. And if you were to put... If you were to take a, a uh, an oscilloscope and and put it across the mains in Glasgow and do something similar in Cornwall or Devon or whatever, you'd see exactly the same waveform. And in fact, this this photo here on the Route Six blog, which can I bring that a bit bigger, is it's not from Britain, it's from um, Albania. And these are three towns that are separated by um, no Bucharest. Bucharest is the capital of. Help me out. Bucharest is the capital of Reese. Hungary. Hungary. Oh. So this must be from Hungary. So this is this is um, the the Hungarian national grid, and and these are towns <coughs> separated by what eight hundred kilometres in total, sort of north and south of Buc Bucharest, and you can see that their their mains waveform is identical, um, and and what we're seeing there is not actually the mains waveform. We are seeing there the variation from fifty hertz. So forty nine point nine hertz at the bottom and fifty point one hertz at the top of the scale, and we're seeing how their mains frequency varies from 50 hertz. Now, in this country, the law mandates that the mains has to be pretty damn close to 50 hertz, but it's, it specifies it over a four-hour window. So over a four-hour window, the power companies have to provide you with mains that is bang on 50 hertz. But within, over minutes, it's allowed to vary a bit. And typically, it's like 0.1 of a hertz either way. So, you know, a, few, a couple of percent either way. Um, and of course, when, when the Emirates turn on their lighting grid or when, when there's a commercial break in Coronation Street, everybody puts their kettles on, all the generators are a tiny bit more loaded and so they slow down a tiny bit until their regulators kick in and speed them back up again. Um, but, uh, but across the whole country, there is this kind of pseudo-random sequence of the frequency of the mains. And so chatting to um, the guys that met, they said, they said, we thought that there might be something useful in this data. So seven or eight years ago, we started digitizing the mains. And you think, well, what on earth, you know? But I mean, if you think about it, you just, it's just a sound card. You just, you just put a big resistor across the mains and you sample it using a sound card. And so for seven or eight years, they've been building a database of mains frequency. And as it turns out, any audio recording you care to mention um, that was either made on a mains-powered piece of equipment or was recorded within earshot of electrical lighting, for example, has this 50 hertz signal down in the noise. And Melodyne, who make plugins for Pro Tools, they, they make the very famous um, harmonizer plugins that you hear all over sort of pop records. Melodyne also make a, a plugin for extracting um, very specific frequencies from um, audio signals. And so you can extract the mains hum from pretty much any audio recording ever made either a, 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 you know, a, a recorder made with an earshot of lighting or a recorder mains that, that's made off the mains power. Uh, and, and it turns out that it's not very hard to match that 50 hertz signal to your database of mains frequencies. Um, and I couldn't believe it when they were telling me this. And so I got home that evening and there's a couple of other podcasts I help with, which I've got a big library of old recordings from. And so I grabbed some, some microphone recordings from years gone by and I sent them to them. But, uh, you know, and these are, these are 64 kilobit MP3s. These are not high quality, high fidelity recordings. These are the kind of thing, you know, that you get from any podcast that you listen to. And within 10 minutes, they'd emailed me back and they said, yeah, that was made on Sunday, the 23rd of August, 2008, at about 11.30 in the morning. That one was made and that one, and they were bang on correct for all three samples. And I was staggered just, just how, how, how amazing it is to, to, how possible it is to do that. Um, and there was a knock at the door. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. And so, um, in fact, they, they were also telling me that they've actually imprisoned a couple of people so far. There's one woman who, um, who was... Um, who uh, example of spousal abuse her husband had been mistreating her for years and she snapped and she knifed him killed him 
and she phoned her friend and said, you know, oh, I've killed Harold, I couldn't take it anymore, kind of thing. And that was presented in evidence in her court trial, and um, her defence tried to imply that the, that the evidence had either been tampered with, edited, or it was made at a different time to the, what the cell phone company said that voicemail recording had been made at. And they were able to show using this technique that it was a continuous recording, no edits, and it was made at exactly the time and date that the cell phone company said it was. Um, and so it's staggering, you know, there's no, and they've discovered as well that it works in video recordings as well. Um, so, so the flicker of mains lights in video recordings, they've now, they're now able to extract that signature and relate it back to their, to their mains frequency database. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of, it's an interesting business, you know, you wouldn't have thought that it was possible, but apparently it is. And unless you're willing to take a battery powered recorder and go and stand in a field, you know, a mile away from a pylon, you know, every main, every audio recording ever made is has this signature down there in the in the noise. The only thing that can't carry it is um, audio recordings made on analog tape, because apparently the tape wows and flutters too much at that very low level um, for you to be able to faithfully reproduce the signal. Really, so it's really it's a digital phenomenon. Well. You kind of imagine that if you could have a time-based corrected analog audio recorder, that you'd you'd be able to extract it. But but yeah, it's pretty much it's it's pretty much digital recordings that you can extract this from. And even very low data rate um, 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 MP3s, you know, mm. even low quality MP3s, they can extract it from. It's dash clever, isn't it? It is. So the next thing I wanted to bang on about, unless anybody else wants to say anything. Once round, Rupert. No, Reese, no, I'm good. Mr. Skeggs. Yes. Okay, so 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 um, the thing we do a lot of, we do a lot of bespoke fibre, and um, there's two uh, different kinds of fibre, um, fundamentally different, and they work in entirely different ways. Um, we've got single mode fibre and multi mode fibre. Single mode fibre is largely used for 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 um, WAN applications, you know, extending networks, that kind of thing. Although in our industry, in television, it's also used quite a lot for extending camera feeds long distances. Um, and the other style of fibre, which we use an awful lot more in what we do in post-production, is, um, is multi-mode fibre. Um, Single-mode fibre uh, is often referred to as OS1 or OS2. They're fundamentally the same standard, just, just tweaked a tiny bit. And, and then we have multi-mode fibre, uh, OM1, OM2, which never really caught on, OM3, which is the standard at the moment, OM4, which is very similar to OM3, but is what they call a graded index optical fibre. Um, they're multi-mode fibres, and they work in a, an entirely different way. Um, Single-mode fibre is a 9 micron um, core going down the centre of that fibre cable, whereas multi-mode fibre is a... Um, is a 50 micron core going down the middle of the fiber. And so the nine micron, the very skinny nine micron core, nine millionths of a meter, works by containing the light uh, perfectly. The, the, the light doesn't bounce down the core. It's, it's kind of contained perfectly within the pipe. A single wave front travels down the pipe. And so consequently, you can, you can get the, 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 the speed of the, uh, uh, of the data that you can push down that pipe uh, up much higher. And it'll go much, much further distances. So single mode fiber, typically will travel, well, the standard that was, was in force until about a year ago was 40 kilometers um, for 50 gigabit data. Uh, and a new standard proposal now, which is just starting to be rolled out, goes to 80 kilometers. And in fact, for the data center, center industry, if you draw a 40 kilometer circle around the London Internet Exchange, around Docklands, um, you'll see where all the redundant uh, data centers live. They're in Slough, they're in Watford, they're in Guildford. They're all places that are 40 kilometers away from the London Internet Exchange. And that's because that's the limit of, or was the limit until very recently, of single mode fiber. Um, so again, single mode fiber we don't do an awful lot of in, in, in TV post, but we do for things extending SDI feeds long, long distances. And um, uh, the recent Arsenal FA Cup weekend, we, we furnished um, the Emirates with a bunch of uh, distance extenders for, for um, HD SDI. And in fact, just chaining a bunch of them together, we sent SDI six and a half kilometers and it was still looking great, you know, still no errors whatsoever. Um, but single mode, that's, that's what that's for. Single mode is, is more specialist. It's for wide area network applications um, and, and, and very long distances for video. But the thing that we do mostly of is, is multi-mode. So let me just get up my, uh, my screen share again. 
Um, and multi-modes, which, which you know, we've all heard of a lot more, OM3, uh, OM2, which never really caught on, and, 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 and OM1, and there are the standards for those. Um, and uh, uh, as mentioned, um, uh, that they're like a 62.5. So if you see written on cable, 62.5 stroke 125 or 50 stroke 125, that's the difference between OM1 and OM3. And, and that's what's referred to as a multi-mode cable. And a multi-mode cable works in an entirely different way to a single-mode cable in as much as the light is now required to bounce down the inside of the tube. The light isn't perfectly contained as a single wavefront as it is with a single-mode cable, but it has to do this total internal reflection business where it bounces down the middle of the tube and gets where it's going as a consequence uh, it loses a lot more energy um, and so whereas you're talking about 40 or 80 kilometers for, for 50 gigabit data for single mode fiber for multi-mode fiber you're talking about 10 gigabits over 600 meters you, you know those kind of data rates um, uh, there is a, a new style of multi-mode fiber called graded index fiber um, which uh, I banged on a bit on the Route 6 blog about recently uh, graded index fiber um, is uh, Oh, it's on my blog, here we go. Um, graded index fiber is is actually uh, exploits a a, a a feature of of um, the glass core of the fiber index of, of of the fiber optic core, where whereby rather than just having a consistent optical quality throughout the core of the fiber, the 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 the, 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 the optical index, the refractive index, uh, varies across the width of that little fifty micron core, so that the glass is if you will, a bit thicker as far as the light's concerned towards the edge of the fibre and a bit thinner, so a bit more optically transparent towards the middle of the core. And so rather than the, 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 the light beam sort of travelling down the fibre, slamming into one wall of the fibre and then being deflected down to the next wall of the fibre and, and losing energy as it does it, it's now more guided, more as a sine wave, sort of gently being you know, guided off the, the inner walls of the fibre. And so graded index fibre is entirely compatible with with non-graded fiber so om4 om3 entirely compatible with each other but you can get about two kilometers at 10 gigabits per second down a graded index multi-mode fiber so these things are ideal for um premises and sort of campus wide um san attachment um uh, you know extending dvi all those kind of applications so there's not just about the 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 the, the, the type of cable used but obviously connectors as well, and, and there you can see a picture of, of the, sort of the very typical kind of fibre connectors we all come across. I mean, the thing that's pretty standard nowadays is, is the LC connector, and that's pretty much used for everything, both single mode and that's multi mode. Click, yep. Sorry, say again? That's lick and click as opposed to lick. stick and click. Exactly. <laughs> if there's a bit, a bit of crap on the end of your fibre, <laughs> give it a little lick. Um, so there are the two um, uh, more... Um, legacy type connectors I suppose and you quite often come across these in premises that have had uh, fibre for a long time uh, or, or having said that I mean the FA who've paid for a lot of football grounds to be rewired for fibre for 3D you know I mean hey how's that going um, that was that, the, the, the company that did that they, they did it entirely in ST connectors because they're sort of perceived as being a bit more a bit more rugged because it's a bit more like a BNC connector you've got like a, a metal um, collar and uh, and uh, perhaps a bit more rugged, but it's a bigger connector. You can't get the density on a patch panel that you can with LC connectors. And then, of course, we all you know remember, I suppose, from the mid noughties the SC connector, which was used a bit. FC connectors never really caught on because they're not appreciably any better than STs, and uh, you don't really see them much. Only in sort of very specialist kind of, um, I think, InfiniBand over fibre runs as a standard with an FC connector but you don't see it very much. The green SC connectors which you still do see a bit because they became something of a, a standard in, in data centers that were, were, were this thing what they call APC connectors, angle polished connectors where they actually use not a, a, um, a straight orthogonal sort of end piece there they used an angle polish connector which all it does is it gives you a bit of incompatibility it means that you can segregate two circuits that look the same from each other. It means you can stop somebody sending data down one circuit uh, if they don't know what they're doing. It's a bit like the old Torx connect. They are Torx fasteners. You know, it kind of forces you to go and find the right piece. It's a little bit different. It's different enough to require a bit of attention. So, uh, you know, you do see green SC connectors a little bit in data centers because APC is still used a bit. Uh, you see ST connectors, you know, on football grounds and that because it's, it's perceived as being a slightly more rugged connector. But for the most part, for all kind of in-premises wiring, the kind of things we come across for both single mode and multi-mode, when I say multi-mode, OM1 and OM3, 
and you know to a degree coming in now OM4 uh, LC connectors are you know the standard and 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 that kind of uh, you know two two connectors held together as a duplex pair you know in the case of a of a SAN connection there's a transmit and a receive fiber um, uh, you know and in the case of a DVI extender that might be the red channel that might be the green channel and then on the next connector the blue and the control channel so uh, that's very standard a duplex LC pair um, you see it everywhere it's, it's pretty much all we do nowadays. Well, that's shut you all up, hasn't it? So, Sorry. as well as, as 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 well as the the the, the style of the fibre, OM1, OM2, OS1, OS2 for single mode, and the style of the connector, you know, SCs, STs, LCs, you also have to consider because we do a lot of bespoke fibre, splicing fibre, how you how you actually put the ends on those fibre cables. What we always tell people is. By far the better way to wire in fibre within a premises is not to use tight buffered cable, like the image I've got up at the moment. This is, this is really how patch cords are made, where the, the inner glass cores are adhered to a, uh, a Kevlar... To, they're, they're, firstly, they're coated in a, a PVC jacket, and then that's, that sits within a, uh, like a Kevlar mesh, you know, kind of like a Kevlar fibre mesh, and then that's coated then with a... a, a a, a PVC, you know, low low smoke, zero halogen jacket. The problem with that cable is that um, it's it's reasonably fragile. It's fine for patch cords. It's fine for running things within a machine room, maybe between two cabinets and such. It's not great when you want to run stuff between floors of a building, because it doesn't have a good minimum bend radius. You you, you know, you try and stress that thing beyond beyond even a modest bend, and because it's all it's all all the all all the everything's kind of glued to itself inside. There's no kind of movement whatsoever. And so we come across this all the time. And the reason people do it is because it's convenient. It's convenient to buy pre-made tight, tight buffered patch cable and run that through your building. But actually, it never lasts and it always fails when you least want it to. And we don't recommend it. The, the thing we recommend is what we call a, a loose tube cable. And, and the construction of a loose tube cable is slightly different. You've got all the fibre cores within that. And, and, and that's contained within a plastic tube, which itself is contained within a, a Kevlar uh, jacket, which is then within a, contained within a PVC jacket, you know, to finish the cable. And in fact, sometimes for really rugged exterior cable, you have a woven steel uh, uh, braid within here as well. But the thing about loose tube cable is that those fibres sit within a, a like a mineral oil, mineral oil bath, like a like a jelly filled tube. Um, which, you know, when you cut the cable, it starts to seep out of it. And it's sort of alarming at first. You think, well, what's, what's this chemical seeping out of the cable? But it's actually there to uh, to, to, to provide for the fibre, well, it keeps moisture out, but it's also to provide for slippage within the fibre. So when you when you bend the cable around a very tight, uh, um, uh, you know, part of its path, that the, the fibres are, are able to slip and slide over each other and, and not be submitted to the same mechanical stress that they are in a tight buffered cable. And that's the reason why you know premises installations and interior and exterior fibers we always recommend go with the loose tube do it that way but of course by going with a loose tube it implies you've got to splice the cables you can't you can't get pre-made loose tube cables so you know for many years we've been splicing fiber for people and we started off using this model of fusion splicer this is the this is the machine that puts the end on the cable and this is a, a tritech fusion splicer and it's a real workhorse machine um, it's like a soldering iron for glass if you will it's how you put the ends on um, a loose tube cable, uh, but it's what they call a uh, a, a core alignment splicer, um, and it's not as 100% accurate as you want it to be. And as we move towards OM3, which you know kind of happened about five years ago, and as we start to do a lot more single mode fiber, as we kind of do get into sort of data type applications rather than SAN and and, and DVI and extenders and things like that, um, it's much better to have at hand what they call a a core alignment splicer. So the, 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 the iNo IFS10, which is the machine we use now, we have one of those, we have a couple of the Tritex, is, is, is a much better machine in as much as um, it's not up to you to look down the microscope, as you can see there, and line up the fibres manually using these little vernier adjustments on the edge of the machine there, which was fine for kind of OM1 and that less demanding fibre. But nowadays, the, uh, the, the, the core alignment splicer is really the thing you need. And I've got a great picture here showing the difference. So uh, there we go. Um, if you imagine you had some, some fibre that was maybe marginally at the edge of tolerance, um, if you're just relying on mechanical alignment to splice the cables, the core, which is the tiny important centre part of the fibre, could be misaligned considerably. 
and 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 you wind up you know with with a bad splicing you, you know and it, and it doesn't it doesn't doesn't work as well as you want it to but by using a core alignment machine which does this all in software you know that the, the, the machine has a couple of cameras mounted at right angles and they look up and they identify the core of the fiber and, and the machine drives the fibers together as it's doing the splicing. Um, you get much more consistent, uh, much lower loss connections in your fiber. And in fact, you know, when I look at our wireman and, and, and where's our trainee um, doing it, um, uh, he's able to knock out you know, probably twice as many splices using the core alignment machine, the, 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 um, the INO um, uh, core alignment splicer, than he is using the old Tritex. And we still use the old Tritex um, because they've still got life left in them, but for you know, high volume work, you know, high reliability work, the 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 um the I know is by far the far machine the better machine. In fact, when this style of splicer came out about five years ago, they were like thirty eight, forty thousand pounds. There was one Japanese manufacturer called Fujikura who made them. Um, and now thankfully there are several manufacturers making them and I think you can pick you know we picked the, the IFS ten up for five thousand pounds. The Tritex when we first bought them were seven thousand pounds each, but nobody really buys cladding alignment machines anymore. Uh, so uh, so yeah, all, all, all the work we do now is pretty much done with the IFS 10, and it's a fantastic machine. It really is really very reliable. You know, turns out lots of, of good low loss splices. So we we love it. So that that that's uh, that's my uh, that's my little 10 minute trip round how we do fiber. So what's the um, what do the 15s do? Are they better than the 10s or? Um, uh, the fifteens are a more recent machine. Um, uh, you know, so we bought the we bought the ten eighteen months ago. Uh, the fifteens are a more mm. recent machine. They've got um, some better features for testing the fiber once the splice is done. So rather amazingly, I don't know how they do it. And the manual doesn't really tell you much. They give you a reading of how lossy that splice is um, as you do the splice. Um, the fifteens are apparently better at it, and they keep a record of it, which you can download subsequently. Um, so I, you know, it's not the kind of thing you'd spend extra money for nowadays. You know, the extra thousand right. quid or whatever. But um, the, the, you know, the, the, it's just a nice little addition, isn't it? Mm. Cool. So, any, any, anything you've kind of always wondered about fibre, but were were sort of like too embarrassed to ask? What's uh, what, 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 what's the kind of thing that that? that... I, I was just intrigued to know. You were saying when you were running the. Um... The, the the fiber in for Arsenal you you used did you use single mode yes because the application at Arsenal was to get um, HD video long distances and um, yeah you look at all the standard for HD video over over fiber is I mean, just in very simple terms sorry I mean yeah. basically any distance is always single mode. Yes, yeah, 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 but because of, because of the way that the, the, the fibers, the, the way single mode and multi mode work with respect to each other, um, it's always going to be single mode for anything more than a few hundred meters, for anything more than within premises. So I've got. So why a, would you not use single mode within a facility? Because uh, it's expensive. It's it's more expensive to manufacture. Oh. Although having said that, the differential has got a lot closer nowadays. But uh, but but oh. the other the other thing to consider is that. Um, Multi-mode, you can build a very, very cheap host adapter card to drive a multi-mode cable. That's why you can buy from Atto or from whoever a very cheap yeah. multi-mode fibre channel card. You know, is it um, is it worth mentioning long range and uh, short range SFPs as well? Yes, and absolutely. So, so originally the joy of single of, of multi-mode fibre was that you could build an SFP that used just an LED. That all it, that's all you needed to send you know a few hundred meters down a, a multi-mode fiber it would work with an led emitter uh, but as om3 has become more the standard um uh sfps have tended to move more towards these things they call v cells vertical cavity it's a it's a, it's a solid state laser essentially uh which gets more expensive and 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 and, and if you're in the multi-mode game and you want a long distance SFP, it's a V-cell SFP that you're after. Um, whereas in single mode, they all use a laser, and that's why single mode SFPs tend to be more expensive than multi-mode SFPs. But just to boil it down, simple terms, SR, short range, LR, long range, would you always have an, if you've got single mode fiber, OM1? Yep. Sorry, is that right? Yes. OS1, optical single OS. mode, OM optical multi-mode. Yep, so OS1, single mode fiber you would always need a long range laser to drive it is that correct uh no you can get short range single mode uh but you kind of wonder why you'd bother 
You know, if you're extending between two premises that are a couple of pr- kilometers apart and you want to extend, you know, two switches to each other, that wouldn't mm. work using a short range SFP. And if you've got the expensive long range cable in place, why wouldn't you use an LR SFP? So, in a practical example, happened to me not long ago. If you had two multi mode HS- HBAs, yes. Um, in a, you know two computers that weren't all that far away, but you know reasonably you know the other side of a building, and an engineer ran in a single mode cable. What would that be a bad thing? Uh, well, not only are single mode and multi mode entirely incompatible with each other, but different different standards of multi mode are entirely incompatible with each other. So if you plug a an OM three patch cord into an OM one uh, wall port, um, uh, you get two and a half dBs of loss because of the different core sizes, 50 microns to 62.5 microns, and you're lucky if you'll get one gig traffic down that. It's very lossy. Yeah. Um, so, so you can never... It appear to work, but not, but not well. You'll just get loads and loads of packets dropped and, and yeah. you know... But what I'm saying is if you, if you were to do that, so let's say you know, you've got a Miracom 10 gig card with a short range laser in it in one PC, you've got a Miracom 10 gig card with a short range laser in, it, in another PC, and you were ill-advised enough to run an OM... So a, a single mode fiber between the two, it would appear to work, but it would work quite badly. Uh, as well, if so. they were short range single mode SFPs, it would work just fine. If they were short range multi mode SFPs, you'd be knackered. It wouldn't work at all. Yeah, but it would, it would appear to work. No, it wouldn't work at all. If it was, if you'd mismatched a multi mode, a fifty micron or sixty two point five micron sender with a a nine micron cable, it wouldn't even appear to work. You get nothing. Really? Yeah. Okay. The um, I'm sure that's what happened to me recently. But anyway, um, the, the 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 standard for video over fiber was 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 ratified in 2006. It's uh, SMPTE 297M, and in fact, it's a it's it's actually a, a really well established standard. Even Black Magic can comply with it. So uh, mm-hmm. at your place, Reese, at NBC Universal, the the, the big mm. the big Miranda Envision router in your dub room that feeds the, the your big viewing theatres downstairs. Um, yes, it leaves the. In fact, this blog post is exactly about that. Um, it, it leaves the the matrix, um, the Envision matrix on fibre, shows up downstairs in the theatres on fibre, and we've got we've got Envision Miranda matrix at one end, and we've got Black Magic uh, fibre converters at the other end. Um, so, so pretty much anybody who does video over fibre complies to that standard, and they all they all work nicely with each other. So, uh, mm. well, a rare occasion. When, silly. Yeah. On on your on your camera, yeah. can you demonstrate. A risky bend radius and a not so. You know what I mean? What when we talk about bend radius on a patch cord? Where, where, what, what sort of? Um, so what, what sort of bend? So are we talking um, about when it? Uh, so we're talking about fifty millimeters for tight buffered cable. You shouldn't take. No, no show t- us, mate. Where's your camera? Okay, Come on, I'm, I'm gonna, Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nick off and grab a couple of samples of cable. So uh, talk amongst yourselves. Right. I'll, uh, I'll. Because Dave, you, I remember vividly, Dave. You actually, when you were at NTV. We yes. had one of our one tight buffered one of the cables in the rack, and we had an intermittent unity problem for months. And eventually, it turned out to be somebody just cable wrapped a fiber optic cable a little tighter than perhaps was. Exactly. Yeah, it was just a uh, yeah the bend the radius was just a little bit too much, and then yeah two little cable ties. And but yeah, it, was, it was incredibly hard to find. Yeah, it was just nearly tight. working, but not not enough. Yeah, it was totally intermittent. Yeah, um, which when you kind of looked at it and finally found it was not obvious but yeah it was kind of self-explanatory that yeah okay it needs to reflect around the corner which mm. is, I guess takes a little bit too long um, I think with the, the woman who'd been involved they didn't really kind of get it, it was quite early on in, in fiber in fiber yeah yeah it was uh, yeah. Unity, unity three yeah unity three Tidy, tidiness and one out over um whatever bagginess the old is it ZR chassis god I don't remember are you talking about MTV? Yeah, yeah. it was yeah the, the fibers. Yeah, yeah, that that was tight. That was tight cable ties that that, that was the cause of that. Yeah, you know that's curse what, of the one. Yeah, a lot a lot of people like to use um, Velcro. Uh, which I think it's a good idea for keeping fibers in check in in a bay. Yeah, the yeah. problem with Velcro is people fiddle with it. I find so that's and, true. Yeah. And, and, well, the, the other thing we, then, we we do a bit is we we run if we've got to run tight buffer cables between cabinets, we put them through Copex. You know, that's like rigid plastic tubing. That, that works quite right. nicely. So this is this is a piece of uh, loose tube cable, and if, I don't know if you can see down into that, 
But uh, there's <laughs> there's the um, there's no lights coming out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's the uh, that, that, they're the fibres sitting in their little bath of oil, mineral oil, and and, and a nice Kevlar armour. And um, this one's got steel armoring on it as well. So, so you'd have no trouble doing that with that kind of cable. So, so that, that, would, that, that would not... And can you see, look, can you see how the fibers have slipped and slided? And you can, you can kind of see the gooky, yeah, the gooky yeah. stuff here. So that's what this cable is good for. So, so that's, a, um, that's a 30 millimeter minimum bend radius. And that's what this is specified for. Now, so here's a... Um, so are they bi-directional, those cables? What do you mean are they bi-directional? All cables are bi-directional. What are you talking about? <laughs> So, so this your is arrows a... tell you which way the microns go. <laughs> yeah. Which way the electrons are running here? Yeah. So, like all the good audio cables, mate. So, so actually, I could have, I could have abused that one a bit more, but it's quite because it's because it's, it's steel armoured. Um, ah, you know, you can't. It's kind of almost it stops you doing it, but you'd have no trouble doing that. I said, I said thirty um, millimeters. This has actually got a got a sixteen millimeter minimum bend radius. This cable. So that, that's the kind of what you could get away with without worrying about the quality of the. Of the um, of the signal going and that these kind of patch cords you don't really want to do much more than about that you know that's you know and you yeah. can, you sometimes see them kind of like you know somebody's sort of done that you know yeah. and 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 oh you think oh my word you they're just not man enough for the job uh, so while I've got this up on camera this is this is OM3 it's OM3 patch cord uh, 50 stroke 125 multi mode uh, ver- LC LC connectors, the standard kind of patch cord you use for connecting a sand client. Or, or I mean, yeah, well, that, I mean, that's a good point with the LC connectors. A lot of uh, problems that you have is you have to send over or swap over the, the you know, the pairing. Exactly. So, get... so this is kind of akin to Ether, the way Ethernet crossover cables used to be in the old 100 base yeah. T days. And and so if you look at that, you get the, there is, there's the duplex pair, the send and the receive, um, as far as data is concerned. And now, you show you... the one's got like a yellow leg or a little... Yeah, that's right. One. Now, out of yeah, the yeah. out of the packet, you buy these from most manufacturers. Some of them are crossed over, some of them aren't, uh, and there's no consistency to it. And that sounds outrageous, but we found this to be the case all the time. Now, Comtech, who we buy all our parts from, they tend to be a lot better than others. But um, when we've bought from other people, it's just it's just a it's just a duck shoot. What are you going to get out of the out of the bag? Um, and the the thing is, if you've got a sand client going back to any to a fiber switch like a you know sandbox you know melanox or whatever fiber switch um, that will be point to point that will be on the on the a side of the connector that will be the transmit and the b side will be the receive and the switch knows that and so the switch does the right thing if you're going host to host so from something like a terablock where there's a fiber card inside the chassis of the computer going to a fiber card inside the chassis of the client computer then um, uh, you have to have a cross cable because it's a bit like going between two Ethernet computers if you've not got an Ethernet switch before gigabit Ethernet, which does it automatically. In the days of of, te- of 110 base T, you'd have to have a crossover cable. You know, the, the green and the orange pair would have to cross over in the cable. It's the same thing with fiber. If you're going between two hosts, you know, so like a terablock or something that has the fiber card inside the computer to uh, the client machine, um, you'd have to have a cross cable. Now, we wire all our premises wiring panel to panel directly a to a b to b so we always know where we are but people often complain that they've had to put a cross cable in either in the edit suite or in the machine room where the terablock is for that reason uh, but you just have to know when when a cross cable is needed and when it isn't needed and i know a lot of installers will put crosses in in their premises wiring in the hope that people then don't have to use a cross cable but it's it's you, you never know when you need one or the other That's shut you all up, hasn't it? <laughs> the, the, last thing, the last thing I wanted to show you about fiber, and um, excuse me, just while I, while I go and grab something else, so I'm just going to put something up on screen, which is a, 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 a some pictures of um, the ends of patch cords taken down a fiber microscope. I'm just going to grab the microscope and show you what it looks like. Hang on. So this is... Me like what we did at 360. This is what happens when you splice with dust in here. So the thing that bedevils us on lots of installations is the fact that we still have to work with builders. And builders make lots of dust, particularly from plasterboards, and that's that's a real killer for us. Um, and and so I've got up on screen at the moment some pictures taken down my trusty um, uh, 
uh, a JDSU uh, fiber microscope. So if I go back to my camera, you can see what this thing looks like. Um, stand by. Um, so this is a this is a fiber microscope, and uh, you know you, you get you get different inserts here for LC and SC and ST, uh, and and there's the eyepiece there, and you, you essentially there's a there's a um, it's battery powered, so you can see I've, I can turn it on and off, and it looks down the fiber, and and you can see what the state of the end of the fiber is. So if I go back to my screenshots, um, so you can see kilometers of that Phil, can you? No, you can just see the end of the fiber. So, so, so you can see here, this is, these are some pictures taken at uh, ITV in Manchester, uh, ITV in Media City, um, and, and this is builder dust. These were brand new patch cords after a few weeks of being in place. And, and so it's, it's hard to get it centralized, but you can see the dark, the dark piece there is the overall glass core, and the, the slightly grayer piece in the middle is the internal transmissive core. So I can tell immediately that this is an OM3 fiber because that's 125 microns, and that's 50 microns. Uh, an, o, an OS1 fiber that's just a tiny little dot in the middle, the transmissive core. But you can see this is this is the kind of crud that collects on the end of the patch cords. You look down the the fiber microscope and you can see that. And of course, you can't see that with a naked eye. You know, this is these are tiny tiny things we're talking about here. So the thing I use, I've got one here, is a, a Cleetops, which is a fiber a fiber cleaning machine, which um, I recommend everybody who's doing fiber should have one in their toolbox. Um, and uh, Here's one here. It's just a little gadget that you press this lever down here. That little surface opens up to reveal a pre-treated um, um, sort of alcohol wipe cloth. And when you let go of it, 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 it scoots along to the next bit, like, like, like the old um, roller towels in toilets. Um, you, you know, you get a fresh bit every time. And that's how you clean uh, the end of your fiber. So, you know, if, uh, if I suspected that this fiber patch cord was was not doing the right thing i could i could look at it you know in my fiber microscope and see if the end of the, the cable was full of crap and then i could use the older clean tops to uh, clean it off and and you know me wesley and matt we kind of keep these in our in our rucksacks for those occasions so uh, that's kind of the last bit of the uh, the fiber puzzle if you will well and that's why you should hire phil and matt or matt and phil the video engineers to do the old fibre optic, we do we do like a bit of fibre, and I think over over the years we've spent quite a lot of money on fibre kit and expertise, and all our wiremen who work for us freelance tend to you know get get kind of given the love in due course, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we, we, it's not hard, you know, particularly with those newer style of machines, the the, the core alignment splicers. It's a lot easier now to drive them. Uh, than it ever was and mm. um, there's a lot of people doing fiber badly uh, we see a lot of badly done fiber and uh, you yeah, know we've always tried my to favorite give... story. my Sorry. favorite story you tell me is the man, the man who was licking the ends uh, so so I, I had a friend who was working for the MOD and the MOD do everything over fiber because fiber is really hard to, 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 to put a tap on a fiber and, and intercept it in fact you know, in certain circumstances it is mathematically impossible it's provably impossible to be able to tap data off a fiber and so this particular one and who this is this is pre splicing so this is this is when they used to actually polish the end of the bare fiber and put it into yeah. the connector and 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 cure it in a little oven so so you'd see the wireman polishing on a little glass polishing stone each of the individual fibers it would take half an hour to polish off the end of a fiber and then you insert it into a little pre-made lc end and and then use a little oven to cure it in there and that was called a uh, cold cold cured I can't remember. We, we've never done it. It's, it's quite an old technology. But so back in the late, late 90s, I knew this guy who, who kind of he was doing this at, at the MOD. And his little trick was he'd spit on the end of the fiber before he put it into the, into the ferrule. And, uh, and so human saliva, it turns out, has an optical quality very close to the kind of silicon doped glass that's used for fiber optics and so for 30 days or so this fiber would perform just splendidly and as the saliva dried out it would reveal the, the poor state of the end of the fiber and uh, of course he'd be called back because after 30 days the job's signed off everybody's happy and it was like a a constant treadmill of being paid to come back and redo work you know, not not only was it a bad way of splicing and uh, of terminating the fibre, but it was a dishonest way of, of maintaining, you know, work for yourself. Outrageous! Like freelance editors used to put the pre-roll at ten seconds. <laughs> well, on two-inch machines, you had to, didn't you? <clears throat> yeah, those were the days. No, yeah, I remember. Used to edit with um, 
Yeah, by the time 1900s and, and decks had got to the point you could do a three second edit, I remember there was one freelance editor I used to hide, he'd come in, first thing he'd do is jump into the settings and set his pre roll to kind of five or seven seconds so that, you know, a little bit more time for coffee and cigarettes as it were. <laughs> It always struck me as a, a bit iniquitous as, as, as kind of computers got faster and rendering times disappeared. You know, you'd have to spend more money on a faster computer so that the customer wouldn't pay you as much money to do the same amount of work. It always seemed a bit iniquitous. Mm. Yeah, no, it was funny. I was, I was actually talking yesterday about how everything, you know, you, when nonlinear editing came in, everyone was convinced that, you know, edits would take half the time and, you know, life would be much more leisurely because we'd be able to get the job done quicker and there'd be less stress. But in fact, what happens is decisions just get made later and later. The quicker, the quicker the equipment could do the kit. I'm talking about DPP delivery. You know, all that happens is producers and you know people just make decisions later and later and later. Hey, right. I'm afraid so, I must go. Yep, we've we've kind of got to the end of what we wanted to talk about. Unless unless Reese and and Dave, you've thought of anything interesting in the interim. Uh, no, I've been distracted. I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, mm. I, saw, I saw you on the phone uh, earlier. <laughs> the, day, the day job's kicking in. Well, so, yeah. My gentlemen. Thank you. Cheers, Philly. Okay, before before we go, all go off, can I just mention um, we archive all of these off onto YouTube, and so if you uh, if you, if you go to the Route Six uh, YouTube page, which I'm just sticking up now, um, you can see all our previous ones, and we invite all our industry do you, colleagues. Kind of interest, Bill. Do yeah. you do you index them so yeah you, know, you can kind of jump to bits in them, or or do, does one have to watch them all the way through? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. If anybody knows how to index a YouTube clip, then I'll I'll definitely try it. Um. I've, I think I know a man who does, so let me find out. Mm. Ah, a little task for Mr. Mark Lowe, perhaps. Um, and before Reese and Rupert disappear, can we just have a quick chat about the Ultra? I've just spoken to Nick at RNS. We can stop recording now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gentlemen, uh, okay. thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see you soon. <laughs>